All right. Good morning, church. You may be seated. It's great to have you here this morning. It's a beautiful breeze today on our front garden. Amen. All right. My name is Jeremy, and this is my lovely wife, Carrie, my better half. Uh, if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, as we continue our worship and we read the words of God back to him as we continue our worship. Good morning. So we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. You guys want to open your Bibles? Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will not withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had, not been, he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people all of whom he has led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and striving after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Please bow your heads and close your eyes, uh, close your, bow your heads and uh, as we begin to pray for the preached word this morning. Dear mighty God, great Elohim creator of all things, help us to see this morning that your word stands true. It stood true with the time of Solomon, and it still preaches true today. Let us see that two things are always connected, unity and holiness. Lord, let us see that they are not separated, but Lord, let us unite, but you let us also maintain a form of holiness as we move forward. Let us see that there are many things in this world that will distract us, many things in this world that will desire our attention, many things in this world will pull us to them. But Lord, let us stand holy. Let us stand separate. Let us pull back towards you. Let us unite around you in your holy ways. Lord, help us to reach out and love others. But Lord, let us also remember that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. It is you who created all things. And it is you who we must give all the honor and the glory to. Lord, prepare our hearts this morning. Fashion them so that way we can hear your words, and Lord, we will apply them to our lives. Help us to have ears to hear and not just to listen. Let, let us, Lord, to truly understand what you're telling us to do in this text. And Lord, help us to apply it to the way we live daily. Help us to make this a part of, of who we are in you. Let it be in you, Lord, that we gain our identity, not in anything else. We thank you, dear Jesus. We praise these things in your blessed and most holy name. We all say, amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. After taking uh, a few weeks off, we are back in the book of Ecclesiastes. Actually, we were back there last week as well. And um, I'm excited to be back here. It is a book that I have really fallen in love with. Uh, I've been learning so much from it as I've been uh, reading in, uh, scripture and preparing and other books and commentaries and things like that. And uh, what I'm really excited about, though, is that when, when we finish the book of Ecclesiastes, it's not going to be outside. It's actually going to be inside because, here's some good news, in two weeks, we are moving back inside uh, to the auditorium. And so we're praising God for that, and we're excited about that opportunity. We're excited about air conditioning. 
We're excited about padded pews and not hauling our own chairs to church. Although this has been fun and exciting, we've been doing it for almost a year, and maybe it's just me, but I'm ready to use what God's given us here inside. And so thankfully, we're able to be at 50% capacity inside with not a whole lot of other restrictions. And so what we're going to do to make sure everybody feels safe, uh, we are going to have a a lot of deep cleaning happening. Um, In fact, we're going to have, we're asking for volunteers. Uh, If you want to be inside, then uh, I would encourage you to make every effort that you can. And obviously, we understand work uh, doesn't allow everyone to do this, but if, it, it do, if perhaps it does, this Wednesday, uh, starting at about 10 a.m., we're going to be having a big work day right inside here doing lots of different cleaning. Wednesday at 10 a.m. here at the church, and if you're able to come, we're going to be uh, just doing as much as we can to get ready for that in two weeks. So exactly two weeks from today, we're going to be doing some cleaning this week. We're going to be some doing, doing some cleaning uh, the following week. And I'll explain why we're, why we're starting so soon here in just a moment. Um, and so we're going to open up the balcony, though, or when we do move back inside in two weeks, which is the first Sunday of May. That way everybody can social distance at their own uh, comfortability level. And I want to encourage you to do that. Don't purposely go and sit right next to uh, another family um, if, you can, if you can help it, uh, unless, they, unless you guys have specifically talked about it and you're comfortable doing that together as a family. Um, and then we are going to ask us to wear masks while we're inside. And so hopefully that even those kind of restrictions are not going to last uh, for very long. Uh, According to some of the things I'm hearing from our state government, it seems that sometime near the first or middle of June, we should have just about all requirements uh, for, for COVID, all restrictions lifted. We're excited about that. When we do move back in the first Sunday of May, I want to make it clear we're not going to be having child care at first. So child care is not forever suspended, but it will still be suspended for the time being. Um, and I don't want to give dates because I don't want to make promises that I can't keep. Um, but we're going to be working at restoring our child care, nursery, twos and threes, fours and fives, kids club, all those things uh, as soon as we possibly can. And so thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for your faithfulness and coming out and doing this. It really has been fun to worship the Lord uh, the way that our Lord Jesus did most of the time, which was in the open air. It was on a hillside. It was on lawns. It was outside the temple. Um, They had the temple to worship God right there, and yet oftentimes, uh, because of Jesus' status and not being always welcomed, a lot of his teaching was outside the temple. And uh, so it's been awesome to worship God in his creation and to enjoy the open air and to thank God for the sun and the breeze and all those things. And hopefully it makes us more thankful for what God has given us in this church building. Uh, And hopefully it encourages us and spurs us on to maybe do a little bit more to help take care of it, whether that be through volunteering, whether that be through giving, um, so that we can, uh, hopefully it'll last for years to come. And... um, One of the reasons that we are working so hard to to get cleaned early rather than later is because we will be having a home-going service, a funeral service, for one of the longest members of Temple Baptist Church, I believe the the, the other half of a couple that is the longest members of Temple Baptist Church that we have had here, and that's Ren Johnson. Um, Last Sunday, uh, a little before 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call from Ren's daughter, Bernie, who's here with us today, along with Miss Joanne, and uh, I was told that Ren had, uh, had, had passed and was now home with the Lord. And Ren lived a long and faithful life. Um, he lived 90 years on this earth. He had taught a Sunday school class, I believe, for over 50, over 60 years. Is that right? Over 60 years he taught a Sunday school class here and poured into people. He studied God's word faithfully. He encouraged others. Uh, there are so many things that, that were behind the scenes that we will never know about that he did to support it. Um, our, our auditorium is rightfully named after him and our, our former senior pastor, Pastor John Lyle, who pastored here for 33 years. That's the, the, the Lyle Johnson auditorium right there. And uh, he went home to be with the Lord. And I am, I'm thankful that he's not suffering anymore. I'm thankful that he's not enduring the pains of cancer or of pneumonia anymore. Uh, I'm thankful that that strong body doesn't have to lie weak in a hospital bed anymore, that he doesn't have to worry about falling anymore. I'm thankful for those things, and yet at the same time, my heart hurts, and I'm grieving because we've lost a friend. We've lost somebody that is a father and a grandfather to many uh, in this church and even beyond this church. And so would you please be praying for the Johnson family, pray pray uh, specifically for Joanne Johnson, and that his funeral uh, is going to be here at the church inside um, Monday, April 26th at, I don't have the time memorized, I believe it's 11 a.m.? 
11.30 a.m. So 11.30 a.m. will be the funeral service inside here Monday, April 26th. And that's another reason. We, uh, we, we want to get the place looking good as we, as we celebrate Ren's life and as we grieve his passing. Um, and so... But now we are going to jump into God's word, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And as we do that, as you're turning there, uh, I, want to, um, I want to talk about something, kind of have a little bit of a family meeting for a moment with our church family. One of the healthiest things that we can learn to do as a church family, or as an individual, is to critically evaluate ourselves. Yeah, you could call this being, se- you could call this being self-aware. Um, Knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses. That's a healthy thing to know, right? Uh, That's why people often ask it in a job interview. What are your three greatest strengths? What are your three greatest weaknesses? Uh, I think this is helpful to do personally, and I think this is healthy to do corporately as a church. So personally, let me give you an example. I don't think I'm a bad public speaker. Um, I know how to get people's attention most of the time. I think I can sing okay. At the same time, I know that I have a lot of improvement I can do when it comes to my speaking, and yet, and and, and I also know that I'm never going to make it on American Idol, okay? I'm never going to see my name in lights uh, singing, you know, at the Grand Ole Opry or something like that. And when it comes to athletic ability or working on cars, this may come as a shock, but those things are weaknesses of mine. I know that I am weak in those areas, and trying to pretend otherwise would be at best embarrassing and at worst dangerous. You do not want me working on your car. So when it comes to our church then, let's talk about this corporately. When it comes to our church, I think one of our strengths at Temple Baptist Church is in the biblical knowledge and unity of many within our church, especially those in leadership in our church. I talk to pastors of other churches all the time who have have to work with a leadership team that's in place because they give a lot of money to the church. That's why they've been placed in leadership. Or because they're powerful influencers and they've been around for a long time. And that's why they've been given authority in the church. And when that's the reason that people are put into authority, it causes all kinds of issues. And these pastors run into these issues with that kind of leadership. But I have been so incredibly grateful. We have had our share of struggles over the last three plus years that I've been the pastor and over the last nine plus years that I've been a part of this church. And yet, our elder board has not been one of those issues. I am so incredibly grateful for the men that God has allowed me to serve with. Our elder board here, though, it's in place not because of how much money they have, because none of them have much. They're not in place because of how powerful they may or may not be. Our elder board here is in place because of their passionate love for the Lord, because of their passionate love for his word, um, because they make decisions according to the word rather than according to their own egos, which is a huge problem in many churches. And that has led to great unity on our leadership team. Um, I'm not saying we agree on every single thing, but our leadership team meetings that we have twice a month, they have never been defined, at least in my three years of being the pastor here, by, by, by fighting and arguing and, and passive aggressiveness. That just has not been the case. And it's been awesome. I love our leadership team here. So that's a strength of our church. But an area where I, I think our church struggles And an area that your other pastors and I have spent quite a bit of time grieving over and praying about is in the area of community. Community. Because here's the deal. God created his people. He created the people in his image for community. I mean, you can see this going all the way back to creation in Genesis 1. God makes everything perfect. And at the end of each day, what does he say? It's good. That's good. He reveled in what he created. And then he creates Adam. He creates the first man, the crowning jewel of his creation. Places him in the garden, sets him in this beautiful, good place that he created. But he says something that is stunning that he has not said yet after he creates Adam. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 18, God says, It is not good for man... For Adam to be alone. He needs a companion. He needs someone to share his life with. He needs a partner. He needs a help me. He needs a wife. He needs a friend. And the reason we're wired for community is because we're the only part of creation that God created in his own image. See, God exists eternally in perfect community. 
God is a community, right? In the Godhead, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all wrapped up in one. And we're not going to try to explain how all that works today because, honestly, I don't think I could. I know I couldn't. But God exists in perfect community. God did not create man because he needed a companion. God, had all, God has all that he needs contained within himself, within the divine, holy Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit love each other perfectly. They care for each other perfectly. They are friends in a perfect way. God is a relational creature. But then what happens is Adam and Eve, they sin. Adam and Eve sin. And when they sin, they're separated from God and they're separated from each other. And this is what sin does to us, right? It separates people. It separates friends. It comes between spouses. It comes between parents and children, men and women. And we live in a culture where it's becoming increasingly hard for us to build community with other human beings. And technology isn't helping us, is it? I mean, the more plugged into technology we get, the less connected we become in personal relationships. A husband and wife will go to dinner. or I, I see it a lot with people taking their children to dinner. I'm talking about older children, middle school, high school age kids. Mom, dad, all the kids, they've all got their phones and their tablets out. They're not talking to each other. If they need something, they'll text each other from across the table. They'll comment on each other's Instagram posts about their awesome food and their amazing date night that they didn't spend actually talking to one another. And it's led to people having split personalities. Like there's me, right? And then there's social media me. Right? There's me, and then there's Instagram me. There's online Jane, and there's offline Jane. Online Jane is funny. Online Jane is joyful. Online Jane takes the perfect pictures because she loves Jesus and she's got her perfect coffee cup that has her favorite Bible verse on it right there and they open to, her, uh, to Proverbs 31, for example. And it's got the perfect sunrise happening in the background and she's got her little cross on the wall that, and then a little sign that says live, laugh, love next to it. And it's great, right? She's Instagram spiritual. She quotes Bible verses on her Instagram. She, she brags about her husband and kids and takes pictures of the glamorous food she makes and the great places she visits. And everybody wants to be the kind of mom and the wife and the woman that Jane is on Instagram. Offline Jane, she's a little different. Life isn't really so glamorous for offline Jane. She struggles with depression. She's too busy for friends. She can't be bothered to serve at church. I mean, she's got to deal with her kids all week. Why would she want to come do that here at church? She's exhausted at the end of the day. It doesn't really feel like making dinner. She snaps at her husband, but you never hear about that. She never posts a picture of Kraft macaroni and cheese. She never tweets, my husband is a slug and I just chewed him a new one. Hashtag my life sucks. Hashtag my husband is a bum. Hashtag my kids are out of control. Nobody shares that kind of stuff, do they? But our problems go beyond social media. Because study after study finds that we are living in a culture of increasing isolation. We're getting further and further away from other people. We know more than we ever cared to know about someone, and yet we know far less about them. Here's a statistic. 25% of Americans say they have no one with whom they can discuss personal troubles. That means that if the, the statistic holds true, one out of every four people here doesn't have someone that they can confide in. That's double the number from 20 years ago. The most famous study comes from a man by the name of Robert Putnam, and he's a sociologist at Harvard University, and he wrote this book called Bowling Alone. And he argues that a culture is held together by something he, he, he terms social capital. Social capital. And social capital comes from networks of people who care for each other in tangible ways, ways that you can see and feel and touch. And they don't just feel warm, fuzzy feelings about each other. So when it, here's, what, here's an example of social capital. When a friend picks you up at the car repair shop and you don't have to pay him for gas, that's social capital. When you come together to accomplish a good thing like building a house or a, a, a well in a third world country, that's social capital. When someone watches your dog so you don't have to put them in a dog kennel, yeah, that's social capital. Do, doing something for friends, neighbors, family members. And it's declining rapidly in America. The things that used to build social capital are being dismantled. So, for example, he notes that every 10 minutes of commuting, just 10 minutes, decreases social capital by 10%. So then if you commute 
one hour to work and one hour home, you are in a social capital deficit. Because we no longer work where we live. And this has created this problem, especially in America and especially in the Inland Empire, when the vast majority of people who work do commute somewhere. We build suburbs so we can drive to where we work. We build dream neighborhoods, but we don't know our neighbors because we don't have time to know our neighbors. And this has led to all kinds of other trends. Over the past 25 years, eating dinner as a family is down 43%. Having friends over for dinner is down 35%. Okay? So sin has these very real consequences. It has personal and social consequences. It brings loneliness. It brings isolation. It reduces us to this service-based culture where I have to pay for things that friends and family used to do for each other. Because I don't have time for friends. And then what happens for us in 2020? COVID comes along and makes a bad problem about 200 times worse. We're even more isolated than we were before. We know people even less than we did before. We go over to people's homes or have people into our homes even less than we did before. And now here's the deal. Long before this Robert Putnam guy, long before Harvard, Uni Harvard University was an idea in anyone's head, we had King Solomon. This incredibly wise, incredibly powerful, incredibly rich king. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he looks at people and he sees how busy they are and he notices that they're lonely. They're isolated. And he tells us why. He gives us the biblical diagnosis for our lack of social capital. So let's just start walking through this together. Look at verse 7. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. So the first thing that kills community is a guy or a gal who works all the time. And the problem isn't hard work, okay? Don't hear me saying that. I'm not saying that you can go and just quit your job and be lazy and binge watch Netflix. That's not what we're talking about here. Diligence and hard work are praised in Scripture. In fact, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 and 27 says, The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful or the lazy person will be put to forced labor. Whoever is slothful or lazy will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. Okay? So Solomon isn't talking about diligence when he says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. He's talking about a lonely person who does nothing but work. And he's working so hard that he has no time for anyone else. Verse 8 literally reads, he doesn't have a second. He doesn't have a second left over. Either son or brother. His life is all about number one and he has no time for a number two. And why is that? Because his eyes are never satisfied with riches. He can't get enough. He never has enough money. Let's just ask this question. Does anyone here ever have enough money? Does anyone here have enough money right now? Really? Uh, yeah, I see like a, a third grader, fourth grader back there. He says, I have enough money. Yeah, good for you because not, none of it's yours, right? No, none of us do. We can always use more money. We can always make another house payment. It would be great to have a car paid off. It'd be great to not have the credit card bills or the student loans or whatever the case might be. We can never have enough money. You never do, I don't. If you do, man, please let me know. And after the service, I'm happy to take a check. We always want just a little bit more, don't we? Now, if you could go back to a time when this person wasn't working like crazy, the person, this theoretical person that Solomon's talking about. If you could go back to a time when this person wasn't working like crazy and you could say, okay, so you're about to start a new job and it's going to pay well. Why do you want to have this job? What will motivate you to work hard? He'd probably say something like, well, because I want to have money to enjoy life. I want to be able to afford things my parents couldn't afford. I want to be able to give my kids things that I never had. How many of you have ever had thoughts like that or said things like that? I have. I want to give your kids things that you never had. I want to be able to take nice trips and buy nice things. But now fast forward. And here we are, and this person is working like crazy, and they realize that while they may have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of friends. They don't know their own children. 
They don't have a connection with the very people who should naturally be close to them. Sons and brothers is the example that Solomon uses. They might be divorced. And so they look back and they think, why am I doing this? What was the point of this? Who is all of this for? Why am I not enjoying it more than this? And how many, let's just use an example. How many people do you know that have a boat but never use it? Yeah, you all know somebody that's got a boat that doesn't use it. They don't have time to enjoy it. Or who have a hobby but they don't have time to enjoy it. Who have children or grandchildren but are too busy making money to play with them or build a relationship with them. So you see what's happened. The very things and the very people that were supposed to benefit from your work can actually become casualties of your work. This person is alone, no friends, no family. Why? Because of his work. And I see people who do this all the time. Heck, I, I've done this. This is me. We convince ourselves that we're working hard for our families and our friends. And at the same time, we're being seduced by ambition and riches to neglect our family and our friends, right? This is so typically human. We take a good thing and we turn it into an ultimate thing. We turn it into an idol. We turn it into a deliverer. We turn it into a pseudo-savior. We attach ultimate significance to it. We worship this good thing and it turns back and betrays us and it never saves us. And so Solomon here is redefining what it means to be wealthy. And he says that the goal of wealth is to enjoy life and glorify God. The goal of wealth is not money. Money is a means to an end. Money is not the end. That's worth repeating. Money is a means to an end. Money is not the end. Mo and here's the deal. Money is not evil. People like to say that money is the root of all evil and they think they're quoting the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. The love of money is the root of all evil. So the idea that Solomon's trying to get across to us is that we don't live to work. We work in order to live. But if we're not living, then what's the point? See, if you define wealth as money, you're going to kill yourself. But a, a, a wealthy person, biblically speaking, is not the one with the most money. It's the one who knows how to live as God intended. It's the one who can enjoy the life that God has given him. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 17, better is a dinner of herbs, basically better is a salad where love is, than a fattened ox, than a, than a prime rib, than a, than a bone-in ribeye steak from Fleming Steakhouse. Whew. And hatred with it. Better is a cheap salad where love is than a ribeye steak and hatred with it. See, wealth is not defined by what's served on the table. Wealth is defined by what's sitting around the table. The wealthy guy is the one who enjoys sitting down with his family for dinner. They like each other. They laugh. They eat. They pray. They live. We think our kids need nice food and nicer clothes and name brand things. But they don't. They don't need the steak. What they need is the love and the relationship and the laughter. It's amazing when I talk to especially older people that grew up in a totally different era than I did. And they talk about, I mean, I, I used to have a pastor that grew up and in, uh, in, in the Midwest. And their family was so poor that he literally, they had dirt floors and no indoor plumbing in their house. I didn't know that was a thing in the last hundred years. But it is. There were people that really lived that way. If you talk to Marvin, uh, he'll tell you people on the Navajo reservation who still live that way. And yet I've never met someone who grew up in a setting like that who knew they were poor unless their parents specifically talked about it all the time. I've never met any kid who hated their dad or their mom because they made them drive around in some beat up old car and didn't buy them a brand new car for their 16th birthday. Never met somebody angry at dad for that. But I've met plenty of kids who've driven $40,000 BMWs who were totally screwed up because their dad thought they could buy a relationship with them. It's not possible. So yes, work hard. Yes, make money. Fine. Do the best you can in the career that God opens to you. But enjoy your kids. Or enjoy your friends. Enjoy your life. Enjoy what God has given you. Enjoy meals. Laugh. Build relationships. Don't be seduced by ambition because it's going to leave you a lonely man or woman. And some of you are lonely because you live to work. 
and you work too much. You have no time for anyone. You keep telling yourself, okay, but when I can just make this amount of money, then I'm going to be good. It's so easy for us to fall into that trap, isn't it? As soon as I pay off my credit cards, as soon as my student loan is gone, as soon as we can buy that house that we've always wanted in that one town, on that one piece of property, by that body of water somewhere, as soon as I can afford the boat. The thing is, though, you might get there, and then you're still just going to keep on going. So now Solomon is going to tell us why you don't want to sacrifice family and friends for ambition. And he's going to give us four ways that community actually benefits us. And he's doing this nearly 3,000 years before this Robert Putnam guy in Harvard University. So now look at verse number 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. So Solomon basically says you can accomplish more with two people than you can by yourself. That's not rocket science. When two people labor beside each other, there is a good reward. That just makes sense. Temple Baptist Church would have been run into the ground if I tried to do this alone. I would be a lonely workaholic and we'd all be really miserable. But two are better. See, this is Solomon arguing for more social capital, you could call it, like Robert Putnam. This is you helping me. This is me helping you. It's working together to benefit each other. That's what families and that's what friends and that's what church families are supposed to do for each other. They're supposed to be families. It's not a cute word there to, to quote in a Bible verse or put up on a wall by your dinner table. It's to be lived out. We're to actually treat each other like family, which means sometimes we argue. Sometimes we get on each other's nerves. But at the end of the day, we'd give the shirt off our back. We'd walk five miles in the snow uphill both ways, barefoot, across glass for the people we love. That's what family does. And this is why we have to get better at community as a church. It's why we have to be so intentional as we, as we come start reacclimating to a post-COVID-19 world. Please hear me. If you don't hear anything else, we've got to be intentional about this in the coming weeks and months. If not, this church will die. Any church will die if we don't start treating each other like what we are, a family. We've got to work hard to invest in one another. We've got to work hard at building relationships with one another. We've got to get back to classes and community groups. And, it, and, and to do that is not just about sitting on couches and sipping on coffee. It's not about just passing out connection cards. It's about those times when you go, hey, I'm, it, it's, it's about those times when you say, hey, I'm, I'm moving. Can anyone help? And 15 people show up and a two-day job turns into a two-hour job with laughter and pizza and conversation. It's about those kinds of things. Read verse 10 with me. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Is anyone out here not a sinner? You're not a sinner? No hands? Okay, good. That's what falling is that Solomon's talking about. So what do you do when you fall? Where do you go when you fall? I'll tell you one of the saddest things about ministry. One of the saddest things about being a pastor is watching when someone falls. Because they've never taken the, and because they've never taken the time to build relationships, when they fall, there's no one to go to to say, come on, get up, I'll help you. I'll walk with you. See, I don't think verse 10 is just about the guy who's in the hospital and lonely. I think it's about the guy who stumbles over sin. One guy has a group that he can run to when that happens. Guys who will help him and encourage him, who will pick him up. The other guy, though, has no one. He's trying to battle porn alone. He's trying to battle same-sex attraction on his own. He's trying to grow as a husband or as a father or as an employee or whatever, but he keeps falling and he has no one to lift him up. He's trying to battle an addiction. See, we're all going to fall. We're all going to screw up sometimes. And this needs to be a place. And don't crucify me for this, but it needs to be a safe place place. I know that's a buzzword and people talk about it for college students that get a bad grade and this isn't a safe place for me to not study. Um, no, but in all reality, this needs to be a safe place for believers. For people who struggle and who fall and who fail because we're all these people. 
But here's the deal. When we have a family that's gathered around to support us and help us, the idea is that we don't stay that way. So the old adage, come as you are, we want that to be the signpost here at Temple Baptist Church. But we don't want people to stay that way. But if we don't learn how to become a family and love one another and lift one another up and support one another, then that's exactly what's going to happen. People are going to come as they are and they're going to leave that way too and they're going to look for something else because they've realized this is just like every other social club on the planet. We don't want people to stay where they are. But you're almost guaranteed to stay there if you don't have any friends who love Jesus more than they love you. Look at verse 11. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? So now in ancient times, it was very dangerous for you to travel by yourself. Because if bandits didn't get you, then the weather probably would. And so they would share their tents with one another. And they would even share their cloaks with one another. And they would even share their body heat with one another. In other words, they would do whatever was necessary to keep the other person from freezing to death. If any of you served in the military during any any particular wars in a place where it was cold, or maybe you have a grandfather that did or father that did, you may have heard some of these stories of them having to do this. But they got to do whatever's necessary to keep the other person from freezing to death, even sharing their lives with them. Do you have friends like that? Not friends that are going to necessarily sleep in your bed. Don't, Don't get too worried but friends that would give you a room in their home or apartment so that you're not left out in the cold. But here's the deal. Friends like that aren't made overnight. So you can't expect other people to be that kind of friend if you're not also being that kind of friend. Friends like that don't happen because you've been in one community group together for one semester. They take time. But two are better than one, especially when the second is a friend like that. Now look at verse 12. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And then a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Do you have someone who will fight for you and with you in this life? Like this goes back to the issue of sin. A good friend is going to pick you up and won't let you fight sin alone. He doesn't just go, hey, I know you've got a porn problem. It's going to be okay. Pat you on the back. I know you're struggling with an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction or whatever the case may be. You can do it, brother. That's not a friend. A good friend comes alongside of you and says, let's fight this together. But a good friend also says you're going to need to be honest about the battles that you're facing. You might be able to kick this alone, but you've got a much better chance if we do this together. Let's dig in, let's go deep, and let's do this. Don't you want friends like that? You want some, when, when you are able to go to somebody and say, man, I'm struggling spiritually. I'm doubting my faith. And a brother or sister comes up beside you and says, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you in this fight against doubt. We're going to read some books. We're going to study scripture. We're going to pray every morning. We're going to do this together. I know you struggle with lust. I know you struggle with same-sex attraction. And I'm your comrade at arms. Let's batter this, battle this together. We are soldiers. We are brothers in arms. I mean, oh, church, we, lo- we should long for this. We should long for these gospel-centered, Christ-exalting, sin-killing friends like this. But they don't come easily. We've got to dig our heels in. And just in case you think this is about just having one friend, Solomon says, no, 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 a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If two is good, three is better. Friends like this are a massive gift from God, and you should be ready to take as many of those friends as God will provide you. Let's finish up this chapter. Verse 13. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. So here's what Solomon's doing. The person in verses 7 through 8 devoted his life to work. 
threw everything he had into his work, and then he lost his companionship. He was left solitary and alone because of his choices. And now we have this old, foolish king who will no longer take advice. He fired all those closest to him. He doesn't need anyone else. He made the decision to go it alone, and the end is the same. He is all alone. So here's a guy who went from prison to palace, and he's stupid enough to think he did it on his own. He failed to see how companionship and community were the instruments of his success. He didn't become king because he was a genius. The idea that anyone is a self-made man or woman is a lie. There are all kinds of people along the way who helped you get where you are today. You had friends and counselors and spouses and children who propped you up on your way. You had teachers and coaches and friends and neighbors, mailmen, government officials, whoever. And now this king looks down on all of them and thinks, I'm a self-made man. But look what happens in the cycle of history. Old rulers become unpopular rulers. Because here's what people do. We look at our lonely, empty lives and we react one of two ways. We either blame something inside of us, our own heart, or outside of us, we blame our leaders. And how many Christians fall into this trap every election cycle, right? That the source of our problems, the source of our unhappiness, the source of the fact that America is going to hell in a handbasket is because if we sit in a White House 3,000 miles away? Seriously? You think that guy is, in char is responsible for all of our problems and all of our issues? That's crazy. We would be happy if only blank were in office. If only so-and-so would have won the election. If only the young, popular, hip, cool candidate was ruling this nation. But nothing is new under the sun. Solomon had seen it all before. And Solomon says people are upset with their lonely, isolated lives. And they blame their leaders. And they say things like, out with the old and in with the new. We need something radical. And then the new guy takes office and he becomes the old guy. And everyone wants another new guy. That's what Solomon is looking at. He'll be popular as long as people are happy. And since a politician can't make people happy, someone is always waiting in the wings who will promise the same thing to a new generation, and that new generation is going to take the bait just like the last one did. And this has application for us, church. You hate your job, and so you blame your boss, don't you? We love to do that. It's really easy. He's got an easy target on his back. The guy who sits in the highest chair is real easy to see and look at. You hate the class, so you blame the teacher. You hate the church because of the pastor. You hate the organization because of the leader. You hate your family because of mom and dad. You hate your community group because of who's hosting it. You hate serving because of the team leader. It's an endless cycle of blaming, and as Solomon calls it, it's vanity and a striving after wind. And you never bother to go, maybe, just maybe, the reason I hate this or that is not because of what's out there, but what's in here. Or maybe the reason I don't have friends is not because of something outside of me, but something inside of me. Can I be honest with this, with you about this? I struggle here. I struggle here. It's, life is busy. <laughs> you got church, you got school, you got kids. If you have a spouse, you got all the things that are, that, are, that are going on. You're trying to juggle, juggle them and you're trying to give your all to each one of them. You're trying to be the best husband or wife or mother or father or friend or roommate or em employer or employee and student. and all. You're trying to do it all. You're trying to give it your best. And it's hard. I struggle with this. I do. I, I know that many people can see me as a guy who stands up in front of people and so I must be really friendly and outgoing and I try to be. I preach about the importance of building community and having gospel-centered friendships. And yet I struggle with this as much as anyone on this lawn. It's hard for me. It's hard for me to want to pour what I've gotten into my family and into getting ready for Sunday and to our team throughout the week and to the schoolwork that I'm doing throughout the week and trying to maintain a relationship with family that lives out, out of town as well and then still try to invest in friendships on top of that. It's hard. I have to work at it. But the thing that I've learned is when I do it, it's so worth it. I've never regretted it. I've never looked back on it and go, man, what a waste of time. 
So how do we get there then? Well, maybe when we sing this next song in a moment, we need to just turn this front lawn into an altar for a moment. Maybe we need to confess the fact that we've treated the church as more of a place to come, feel better about ourselves, check off our Christian duty checkbox list, rather than treating it like a family that we will lean into and love and sacrifice for and help others and get this, accept help from others. Maybe we have people come to the front this morning, just right here. Maybe we have people come to the front this morning and just pray together and confess sin together. Maybe we commit to inviting someone out to lunch today after the service. Or maybe you find somebody today that you can invite to come out next week if that's too last minute. Maybe we commit to serving the church as we prepare to move indoors. I'm telling you, there are a few things that build relationships better than serving the Lord with others shoulder to shoulder.